The Louisville Cardinals were included in the final two for 2024 five-star prospect Carter Bryant. On today's episode of the Locked on the Louisville podcast, we're going to talk about why he could be a game changer for Kenny Payne and the Cardinals. With that being said, let's get right on into the show. You are Locked on Louisville, your daily podcast on the Louisville Cardinals. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, everyone? Welcome into another episode of the Locked On Louisville Podcast. I'm your host, Dalton Pence. I serve as a credential media member for Cardinal Sports Zone. Also, do some PA and outsourcing work for the university in various sports. I want to take this time to thank you all for making us your first listen of the day. And just a reminder: the Locked On Louisville Podcast is free on all streaming services, five days a week. Your team every day. All basketball talk on today's episode of the show. We're going to begin by talking about how 2024 five-star prospect Carter Bryant. Could be an absolute game changer for the Cardinals program. We'll also talk about Sidney Curry entering the transfer portal and what that means for next year's team. And then we'll talk the NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament selection. The Cardinals are the five seed in the region with the number one Stanford Cardinals. So we'll talk about Jeff Walls' squad's journey back to another possible Final Four. So we'll begin on the men's basketball recruiting trail. And there has been a lot of recruiting news just over the past couple of days, and it doesn't seem to be slowing down for the Cardinals, which is a breath of fresh air. It was a dire need for this program. Um, on Sunday, obviously, top 20 prospect Dennis Evans commits to the Cardinals. On Monday, it was announced that Sky Clark officially entered the transfer portal and had then scheduled a visit to Louisville, and he's on campus now on Tuesday. Um, on top of that, five-star prospect Trenton Flowers in the 2024 class it was announced that he is making his commitment somewhere on Friday evening. And according to a lot of recruiting analysts, the Cardinals are trending for the five-star small forward services. But randomly out of the blue, it was announced on social media from both Carter and I believe it was, I'm not sure which recruiting analyst it was, so forgive me. But the Cardinals were included along with the Arizona Wildcats in the final two for 2024 five-star prospect Carter Bryant. Uh, Bryant is listed as the um, fourth best recruit in the country, according to the 24-7 Sports, the number one small forward, and the number one player in the state of California. If you were to base it off of the 24-7 Sports composite rating, which is a .995, that would make Carter, if you were to commit to the University of Louisville, the third highest recruit in Cardinals program history. Third highest rated recruit in Cardinals program history behind Samardo Samuels and Sebastian Telfair. Um, that's a big time commitment if it were to happen. Um, it would be an absolute game changer for two reasons, both um, on the court and on the recruiting trail. We'll start with the recruiting trail. Let's say that Louisville were to get a commitment from Bryant before next season. Uh, before the summer, whenever Bryant dis makes this decision, you not only let's let's play the hypothetical game. Let's say that the Cardinals also get uh, Trenton Flowers committed. Now, whether or not he reclassifies, that's yet to be seen. I know that there's been talks surrounding that, but at this point in time, we don't necessarily know. So, at this point, I'm going to operate under the assumption that he's going to stay in the 2024 class. You would then have T.J. Robinson, um, a low four star. Um, just outside of the top 100. Um, and then you would have Trenton Flowers, who is um, mid-20s, I think number 21 in the country, so not mid-20s, um, low-20s, um, ranked recruit, five-star prospect. But on top of that, you also go out and get a five-star player in Carter Bryant, who is not just a five-star. He is a top five player in the country. That would do absolute wonders in terms of momentum for this recruiting class and recruiting moving forward um, because I think that you know this whole trend and this phenomenon, this notion that top plant, top talent, not plant, uh, top talent, I was going to say like players and talent and combine those two words together, um, but top players, top talent want to go play with other top players and top talent. I think you see that across the country. Duke, 
Kentucky, North Carolina, even Kansas at times. Um, schools that recruit extremely well recruit so or do so by recruiting, um, obviously, at a blue blood, which has its work cut out for it. But also you get some big time players as well. You have, um, you know, that ability to kind of deflect that. Um, you know, recruiting that's not positive from other schools saying, well, what does Louisville have coming in that could help you um, succeed in terms of getting a lot of success next year? You know, we can get you to the league, but you'll also compete uh, for a national championship. Now, will Louisville be at that point in two years? Who knows? Hopefully so. But from a recruiting aspect, this would be a huge momentum booster because it shows that, hey, look, if two five-star prospects and one of them being in the top five believe in what Kenny Payne is doing and believe in this Louisville program, then, hey, maybe I can too. If you're sitting there as a possible 2024 prospect, like Carter Knox, for example, who is friends with uh, Carter Bryant and um, and Trenton Flowers. A 2025 prospect, perhaps uh, Jasper Johnson um, from Woodford County. Um, other players from across the state, other players from across the country in the 2025, 2026, 2027 classes. So um, I think you can't underestimate how much of a boost this would be. It would be a game changer on the recruiting trail because, you know, going out and getting a five star is one thing. And this is no disrespect to Trenton Flowers, but in my opinion, there's a difference between going out and getting a player ranked just outside of the top 20. And another player that is legitimately inside of the top five. Just from a, um, I don't want to say a clout standpoint, but um, just the magnitude of that commitment. That would be huge. Um, on the court, Carter Bryant is a player that is impressing a lot of people in terms of national scouts for his ability to score the basketball at all three levels. Um, Bryant is six foot eight, about 225 pounds. Um, you know, when you watch his tape, doesn't seem to have elite athleticism or elite um, lateral speed at getting toward the basket. But you know, being six foot eight, two hundred twenty-five pounds, does a good job of utilizing his strength, his frame, his ability to create his own shot, can handle the basketball, and has shown the ability to create up for others, especially um, in transition. So I think that that's one thing to look at, and you you see, um, you know, wings across the country that have that ability to create for themselves and create for others and being six foot eight, six foot nine, six foot seven. I mean, that is such a valuable skill to have. And there's no um, doubt as to why Carter Bryant is ranked as a top five player. He's playing for uh, Paul George's AAU team, I believe. Um, and he's set to have uh, a great summer. Bryant has risen up recruiting rankings. And um, I think at the end of the day, not only would this be a game changer in the recruiting momentum department, but also on the court because you are adding a potentially a potential lottery pick to your team, um, a player that essentially has everything you look for. Um, if you look at the woes of the team right now, ball handling, check. Ability to score off the dribble and getting toward the rim, check. Uh, has shown the ability to create for others. Check. He might not be a primary ball handler or offensive initiator, but he has shown the ability to do so. I think he's just scratching the surface of what he um, can project to be as a scorer in, um, you know, in the collegiate ranks and the NBA as well. But um, very, very excited that the Cardinals are in the mix here. And it was kind of out of the blue. Um, Carter Bryant, you had heard um, Arizona. Gonzaga, he had visited there uh, back in February. Uh, he did visit Louisville uh, for, um, I believe it was Louisville Live. Uh, but Duke is also in the mix there. But took a visit to Arizona, so a lot of people think the Wildcats have a very good shot here and potentially could be in the lead. And I'm not here to disagree with that because I really, really don't know. However, I will say this that I feel like is very interesting. Since that news was released yesterday, um, three future forecast changes have been made. Um, Andrew Barth, uh, who is a staff writer, he also has forecast or future casted Trenton Flowers to the Cardinals. You also have Jackson Collier, who um, I'm trying to see who Jackson Jackson, a lot of ACC, uh, Syracuse, North Carolina predictions, and then Rob Holmes. So three rivals staff members 
future casted Bryant to the Cardinals in the past 24 hours. So that's something to focus on. Not sure. Obviously, you can't take that, um, you know, as gospel. But at the end of the day, I, th- I really do find that very interesting. So would be a game changer, Carter Bryant would, for the Cardinals program. So continuing on in the men's basketball talk, we're going to discuss what Sidney Curry entering the transfer portal means for the Louisville Cardinals next season. We'll do that here in just a second. After we talk about our friends over at FanDuel, only about a month and a half left, of the, or I'm sorry, a month of the regular season left, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Um, for my Houston Rockets, Jabari Smith, the last three games, 20 points and 10 rebounds in each of his last three contests. I'm very interested to see what the player props are in terms of points, rebounds, and assists for Smith for next game. We'll see all that, but it shows you how exclusive the bets can be. Don't miss out on the chance to get your no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets back when you go FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. That's not me. There we are. Hey, Cardinal fans, thanks again for making Locked On Louisville your first listen of the day. The NCAA tournament officially starts tonight with the first four in Dayton. It's still time. Grab your bracket. Go listen to the Locked On College Basketball Bracket Breakdown with national analysis and the insights from our local experts. The Locked On College Basketball Bracket Breakdown has everything you need to make the most informed decisions on your bracket. Find the episode on Locked On College Basketball wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. All right, heading on into the second segment of the show, Sidney Curry entering the transfer portal. Look, it's sad, but it was also expected. Curry regressed this past season for the Cardinals, didn't live up to the expectations that many had for the six foot eight, 270 pound native of Fort Wayne, Indiana. After spending um, a couple seasons in JUCO, Sidney Curry decommitted from Kansas, signed with Louisville, and last year, Showed a ton of promise. Only averaged 7.1 points per game um, and 4.4 rebounds per game. But he did so in 13.7 minutes per contest while shooting 67% from the floor. That uh, showed that, you know, with some more usage, uh, Sidney Curry was the Cardinals' best player last year in ACC play. So, um, pretty naturally, a lot of people, including myself, believe that Curry, of all the players on Louisville's team, probably had the best chance to make an all-ACC team, um, in the preseason at least. Now, granted, what would happen in the next couple of months on the court wasn't necessarily what we were hoping for, wasn't necessarily ho- wasn't necessarily what Sydney was hoping for either. Um, in 2022-23, um, saw uh, an increase in minutes, 17.6 per contest, started 25 of 32 games, only averaged 4.9 points per game, um, 4.3 rebounds per game, and 53% from the field. So statistically, he took a little bit of a step back. Um, and I think that, you know, there was just concerns all year long as to um, – you know, him being able to score the basketball consistently like he had done the previous year um, didn't necessarily look that good on the defensive end either. The Cardinals were considerably better with Sidney Curry not on the court. Um, You know, obviously you have to look at teams having another year of film on some of these players from Louisville, so there's probably no doubt that they try to involve him on uh, ball screens and switching ball screens, things of those na- things of that nature. Um, but nonetheless, I don't necessarily look at one spot or one aspect of the game and think Sidney Curry improved in that spot. Granted, I will say this. There had been rumors that he was dealing with some personal stuff, um, you know, away from the court. And obviously, I'm not one to speculate. I don't think that this show is the right place to do that. Um, I'm not one to speculate for clicks or listens. Um, all I can say is that whatever it is Sydney dealt with or had been dealing with, has is dealing with right now, um, wish him the best of luck. Um, because obviously, they're humans first and basketball players second. Um, you know, these athletes go through 
tough times in life, just like the rest of us. And I think that that gets forgotten at times. So um, whatever he's going through, I sincerely wish the best. I hope that he's able to get things taken care of um, and that, um, you know, it's going to be a better season in his life uh, moving forward. Like I said, I don't know what the specifics are. I've just heard rumors, you know, for seemingly from a good amount of people. Um, in terms of you know him dealing with some issues off the court, but we wish him the best. Um, but still on the court, just not exactly what everyone was hoping for. Um, Sidney Curry towards the end of the year, Kenny Payne opting to go more with uh, JJ Trainer, um, Emmanuel Okorafor, Brandon Huntley Hatfield when he got healthy, and Jalen Withers. Um, Curry was seemingly um, a problem on both offense and defense. Um, offensively didn't necessarily seem like he um, had that same efficiency around the basket. Obviously, you know, going from 67% from the field close to the basket to 53%. um, Didn't see him shoot that deep ball or the deep ball, the mid range shot like he had last season. And then defensively, it seemed like teams focused on him and singled him out. And, um, forced Louisville into some tough situations and it got to the point to where he was hurting the team defensively to where you look at the statistical numbers. Louisville was a considerable better team with Sidney Curry off the court uh, defensively speaking, but he has entered the transfer portal. I still think that Sidney has a ton of talent. I think that his best basketball can be ahead of him. Uh, We wish him the best of luck. Thank him for all he did in his two seasons here. Um, You know, Definitely a guy that gave back to the community from basketball camps to just overall being a pillar of this program over the past couple of seasons. So we wish him the best of luck. I think that he could be extremely successful at another destination. You know, a change of scenery may do him good. So we wish him the best of luck as it pertains to the Cardinals next season. What does this mean? Well, really you knew that a couple more players were going to enter the portal after Kamari Lance, Devin Ree, and Fabio Basile. They had to have the spots open up to be able to address those in the transfer portal. Let's say Sky Clark were to commit to Louisville. That would be 13 accounted for scholarships with no open spots available. Well, now with Sidney Curry out, you open up one spot. I would go out and say that this isn't the last of the departures. Four players have entered the portal, um, and you would expect multiple more to enter the portal as well, but it was to be expected. I think that you look at the front court as it stands next year, Dennis Evans, I'm I'm going to classify Curtis Williams as a wing. I'm going to classify Caleb Glenn as a wing slash small ball four. I know Caleb is only 6'6", 6'7", but his playing style, I think, allows him to play that small ball for that wing position. But for this exercise, we'll consider Caleb as a wing. You have Brandon Huntley Hatfield, JJ Trainer, Roosevelt Wheeler, Jalen Withers, and uh, Dennis Evans. You would expect a couple more of those players to enter the portal. So let's say, you know, going back to the episode last week, let's say Roosevelt Wheeler and Jalen Withers transfer. You have Dennis Evans, who's going to be a true five. You have J.J. Trainer, and you have Brandon Huntley-Hatfield. I think that Trainer and Huntley-Hatfield are two solid members to build off of in the front court. Um, and then Dennis Evans being a five. I know he's a true freshman, but defensively he's going to be able to give you solid minutes. Do or Does Louisville look to add to the front court? I think it depends on how many players leave from this year's team from the front court. So if you see Jalen Withers... If you see Roosevelt Wheeler both transfer out, I think you're looking to add at least one more player in the front court, a grad transfer at the center position. Um, But at this point in time, I really think this was to be expected. Sidney Curry was one of the players that across social media, across the media, most people thought of the players that were going to transfer out. You're looking at the two freshmen and Devin Ray and Fabio Basile. Another one was Roosevelt Wheeler and the other one was Sidney Curry. So this makes a ton of sense. It's unfortunate. I wish it would have worked out better for Sydney here at Louisville, but we wish him the best of luck. Wish him the best of luck in his future endeavors at his next stop. But for the Cardinals, this doesn't change a lot of the outlook for next year. It opens up a spot that the 
team does need, and we'll see how Louisville fills that spot. So um, all the men's basketball talk for today's show is over. We're going to now go into the women's basketball talk where the Cardinals will begin the NCAA tournament this upcoming weekend on Friday. Was that Friday? Um, no, Saturday. Sorry. Saturday at 730 as they will take on the Drake Bulldogs. We'll talk about that matchup here in just a second. Uh, before we do that, I want to thank you all again for making this podcast your first listen of the day. Just a reminder, you can find it on YouTube, WHAS 11 Plus, all streaming services, five days a week, your team for free as well. Your team. Every day. The journey back to the Final Four begins on Saturday. The Cardinals received a five seed um, in the region that contains the Stanford Cardinal. I believe it is the Spokane region. No, sorry, the Seattle region um, of the 2023 NCAA tournament. They will take on the Drake Bulldogs, the Missouri Valley, Missouri Valley Conference champions. Looking at the seeds in the bracket, Stanford, the one seed, the two seed being Iowa, three is Duke, four is Texas, five Louisville, six Colorado, seven Florida State, the eight nines Mississippi and Gonzaga, seven ten is Florida State and Georgia, and then your mid-major teams, Middle Tennessee State, East Carolina, Drake, um, Southeast Louisiana and Iona. First thought, what a draw. Um, this is a tough, tough draw for Jeff Wallace's team. I know as Louisville women's basketball fans, we are not used to the Cardinals being anything lower than a two seed over the past couple seasons, but the Cardinals are back as a five seed, and they are in a region with some tough opposition, Stanford, very, very good as the one seed. The two seed, Iowa, Caitlin Clark, as of right now, is the best player in college basketball, in my opinion. You have a Duke team that beat you earlier in the year, although I do think the Cardinals would match up well with Duke now. Texas is a team that you've also beaten earlier in the season down at the, I think it was the um, Battle for Atlantis. But uh, the Longhorns are 25-9. and nine. After losing in the conference championship game, or yeah, the conference championship game to Iowa State. Regardless, Texas, a very, very solid team. They are led by uh, Shaley Gonzalez, who started 34 games, 12.7 points per game. You also have Deanna Gaston and Sanaya Morris. So, uh, three players, actually, five players average over 11 points per game for the Longhorns. Very balanced. Uh, rotation for Texas, but you can't overlook this matchup just yet because the Drake Bulldogs are a team that can really throw a wrench in your bracket if you let them. The Bulldogs, the 12th seed in the Seattle region, 22-9, and nine, the winners of the Missouri Valley Conference, first in the regular season conference championship, but also winning the conference championship as well. Actually, were they? I don't know. They won the Missouri Valley Conference, but on ESPN, it looks like Illinois State, Belmont, and Northern Iowa were right there as well. I'm not sure if they won the regular season or not, but regardless, they won the conference tournament, and that's all that matters. You look at what Drake has been able to do. They're a very, very solid offensive team. They really gave Iowa all they could handle early on in the season, um, lost by six. They beat a uh, ranked Nebraska team at the time by 18 points early on in the season, lost to Creighton by four points. The game against Iowa State was canceled. Uh, they beat Belmont by 31. Um, some very common competition for the Cardinals. Um, and then lost to Belmont by six later on in the season. Drake, a very solid team. As I mentioned, they are led by Maggie Bear, uh, 16.9 points per game. Also, Megan Meyer. You look at, um, you know, the size that this team has, Maggie Bear, six foot three senior, uh, very very solid post player. Uh, Megan Meyer, five foot eight senior, um, you know a lot of veteran presence as well on this team. You have another senior, six foot from Iowa, Grace Berg. So top three scores are seniors, and then Katie Denapier, I think is her name. She is eleven point four points per game. So. A uh, very solid Drake team. The Cardinals should win this one, obviously, being the five seed in this. 
but ultimately, nonetheless, you cannot overlook a team in the NCAA tournament. They will play at the Moody Center down in Austin against Drake. If they win that game, they will take on Texas, which will be another tough opposition. But I think this team is going to get to the second weekend. I think that Jeff Walls' this team is playing very, very good. Um, you look at who they lost to in the last month of the season, a you know, month and a half. Um, after that Wake Forest lost, the only losses came twice to Notre Dame and then Virginia Tech. With each loss, both of those teams were in the top 10. They played them tough regardless. So, And then the Cardinals also beat Notre Dame by nearly 30 points without Olivia Miles, but still very solid um, opposition. That's when you get into a possible need for a 2013 level season. Um, Yo, Wobble is playing very well leading into the tournament. Yo, in the tournament as well, they'll face a Seattle team that probably isn't as good as that Baylor team was with Brittany Griner and Odyssey Sims. But um, yo, make no mistake about it, uh, Stanford is once again um, very, very solid, and they're going to be a tough team to beat. That size is going to be something uh, to look at, and it's going to be really tough to you know overcome. You know most. Notably, you have um, Cameron Brink, six foot four junior, who gave Louisville fits in the Elite Eight a couple years ago. Haley Jones, the senior from um, Santa Cruz, California, is going to be tough to deal with. They have some very solid size uh, that the Cardinals will have to deal with. Lauren Betts, six foot seven center. So ultimately, you know, Brooke Demeter as well, six foot three. I mean, you can look at this whole roster, and there's a lot of six foot, six foot five, six foot three. Ashton Prechtel, uh, six foot five as well, you know, senior. So they have some returners, you know, Francesca Bellaby, six foot one senior. So nonetheless, for the Cardinals to have to advance, they're going to have to pull off the upset against the Stanford Cardinal. And then you look at the other side, Iowa and Duke. Um, this is an opportunity. Obviously, you have to get past the Sweet 16. But if you were to go up against Duke, or even a team like Iowa, who you know has a player like Caitlin Clark. I, I think that Louisville, call me crazy, at least matches up well with Duke. I'm not sure about Iowa. I feel I would feel better if they played Duke Blue Devils in the Elite Eight, but obviously this is a moot point at the moment because you have to get past that first round matchup against Drake. So, 7:30 tip off on Saturday at the Moody Center for the Louisville women's basketball team. We'll have all the coverage of this tournament on the Locked On Louisville podcast. So. That's going to wrap up today's episode of the show. Everyone have a great day. We'll see you right back here.